have some magnetic effect on the magnetic so, 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 uh, the rain is a little uh, dampener. I think half the people are stuck outside uh, with the rain. So, uh, in the current edition of uh, Mandana, we have this uh, subject on uh, legal uh, aid, inaccessible, uh, whether it's common uh, to the common man. And uh, uh, as we uh, had the uh, uh, in fight, uh, Sergeant Boya is here. And uh, he's an eminent uh, lawyer who is a uh, senior advocate of the uh, Supreme Court as well as uh, various uh, high courts uh, uh, in India here. And, uh, this topic of uh, speech and uh, interactive uh, session today is a subject uh, chosen uh, uh, in a view with a grave pendency of uh, cases.
Sajan Gloria is a designated super senior advocate, an extensive constitutional, corporate, and commercial law practice in the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Delhi, Karnataka, Madras, and Mumbai. We founded Koya and Co, a full service law firm with offices at Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, and New Delhi, which presently has in excess of 65 members in its team. Sajan Koya graduated as a gold medalist with a bachelor's degree in arts and honors degree in law from the National Law School of India, University NLSIU, and was a chimney scholar at the London School of Economics and a political science LSE from where he obtained a master's degree in law. He is a fellow of the Society of Advanced Legal Studies, London, and is admitted to a practice of the solicitor of Supreme Court of England and Wales. When appointed additional advocate general for the state of Karnataka, Sajan Koya was one of the youngest ever to occupy that position. He was therefore proposed and designated senior advocate again to Queen Council by the full court of the Karnataka High Court. He chaired the Karnataka State Council of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FICCI, India's Apex Industry Association from 2007 to 2010. He is also associated as a Vice President of the Society of Indian Firm, Law Firms, SILF, Honorary Secretary of the Indian Section, Session of the International Commission of Jurists, and the an India Co-Chair of the New York State Bar Association. Sajan Poya has an extensive litigation practice across the country and has been voted by the Law Asian Chambers and Partners as one of the leading attorneys. The law firm Poya and Co. has been denoted as Asia Pacific Legal 500 as one of the leading law firms in the Asia Pacific region. Sajan Poya regularly represents large domestic and transnational cooperation with regard to their corporate and business litigation in the Supreme Court of India and various high courts in the country. I welcome Sajan Poya. Thank you very much. It's already evening and uh, I'm really thrilled to see as many of you, I really didn't expect uh, as many to be here as I see today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good evening. In particular, uh, Prakash and Jyotika, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and interact with you. When I was told that I should speak at Mantana, I think the name itself gave me a bit of a shiver up my spine. See, Mantana really is a process by which you get both the good and the bad. You get Visha, you get Amrita. And you don't have any Rakhita all the time to absorb the poison, particularly in today's day and age. And I'm really hoping that in the process of this conversation, which I'm proposing to do over the next 40-45 minutes, I really, the net result should be that I have given more positive than negative. And if indeed there are a bit of negative or critical thoughts, do bear with me because I firmly believe that every person must have the freedom to say what he or she will and I am not always politically right. I did think that I will write down something to come and speak to you. Then a thought went through me saying I am not speaking to a bunch of people who are not aware. I am really not speaking to a bunch of people who need to be told on what things are or what things ought to be. I am really speaking to a bunch of people who are aware and consequently have set up something called Mantana and really need the process of churning of ideas, if I can put it so, uh, by which the net result would be that we go back home a little more conscious and not really a little more aware, a little more conscious of the negatives in us rather than the positives in society. And if we believe that we can identify the negatives in us and consequently at some point of time suppress those negatives, the net result in society will be a positive society. And therefore, pardon my imprudence in not having something written, pardon my imprudence in not reading to you something which is structured uh, and, and sweet, 
I personally take this opportunity to share a few thoughts and ideas of what has been working in my mind lately and I'll throw it open for a lot of questions. I'm also conscious that I see a little the younger audience as well here and I think I target what I speak to them more than more than all of us who have possibly spent more than half our lives already and the remaining half our lives will be possibly shared equally between our officers and hospitals. And therefore I hope that we will be in a position to contribute a great deal to society. The topic that you chose today is interesting, but there is enough said about that topic. And therefore I'll start from that topic, but possibly go on to many other things in our lives which actually interrelate to that topic, but uh, possibly we, we don't really consciously consider them to be interrelated. When we talk of legal aid, everyone will tell you, and, you know, in fact, Googling legal aid in India would give you enough information on the Legal Services Authority Act, what does it do, etc. Therefore, I'll spend possibly probably five minutes to portray this concept of legal aid and then go on to other aspects. It's a shame that in our country we really needed a law to constitute a mechanism for legal aid. If you look at the Hindu concept of living, I think Vasudai or Kutumbikam necessarily involves within itself the fact that justice will be meted out to one and all. Vasudhaiva Kutu become also necessarily involves within it the fact that we will not only talk of Sarvodaya but we will talk of Anchodaya and last member in my family as well will attain a particular level of significance in society, will attain a particular level of growth in society that even he or she would have that concept of development. And therefore if you call ourselves a Hindu or Astra in a manner of speaking and not so much a manner of religion, why do we need an act which says that there is something called the Legal Services Authority constituted, that you can actually approach it, if you are the have-nots, if you can't afford the legal services, this authority will provide you with a lawyer, you can actually open the doors of access to justice by through this authority. I think the fundamental domain is that we failed in building something called a Hindu Rastra. And a Hindu Rastra in the concept of saying that I considered me, my neighbor, my family and even the last man in this room as a part of one large family and therefore I would only do unto that last man what I would do to myself, both good and bad. If I am critical about myself, then I have a right to be critical about you. But I do not have a right to be critical about you when I think I am alright and I don't have to criticize myself. Therefore, that said, I think in the urban polity which we have called democracy in India, there was a need for the for the act to come out and indeed between 1987 when, when they promulgated this legislation to 2015, a lot has changed in terms of access to justice. But ladies and gentlemen, that access to justice has not changed because there is a Legal Services Authority Act. The access to justice has not changed because the state also provides for a particular threshold, people below a particular income threshold, the state provides support in terms of lawyers. Not that there is a state legal services authority, there is a district legal services authority, there is a taluka legal services authority, and the national legal services authority will provide you some sort of legal assistance. None of that, if you ask me, has really had the impact of changing access to justice. They have changed the access to courts. You possibly could not have approached courts before if you are from the bottom of the pyramid, because you Courts actually had some sort of an aura among, uh, around it. Court had a, some sort of a fear psychosis around it. Court had a sense of authoritarian perspective around it. And therefore, bottom of the pyramid rarely approached courts. Legal Services Authority Act indeed changed that in terms of people accessing courts. But it did not change it from access to justice, if you can call it so. In my view, the single phenomena that has changed access to justice in our country is the internet. Simply because, let me give you two examples. Let's take ourselves back to 1985 or 1982 or even 1987. If a common man in Karnataka, a common man even in one of the streets of Bangalore in 1985 wanted to get some amount of access in terms of saying whether my footpath is right, not right, if the footpath is actually bad, who can I complain to? Or if, if I have an electrocution scenario where there is a live fire on the streets of Hyderabad and somebody is actually electrocuted, where can I go and challenge it? Where can I actually invoke the authority to get some justice? There was no concept of information being available to you. We did not have the Right Information Act. But be that as it may, we did not even have the domain of perspective to say, who do I go and ask? Therefore, you necessarily had to go to a lawyer. 
to ask a lawyer to say, listen, this is the problem, do you think I have a solution? And therefore you needed something called the Legal Services Act to say, hey, you can't afford a lawyer, therefore I will give you. I will possibly provide you a pro bono lawyer or a free lawyer who will give you that person. But today the same thing happens. At the click of a button, I think Google is the best lawyer that you can find on earth. You will have enough information available to you of who is responsible to maintain this uh, footpath, who is responsible to maintain that electric pole, what happens in the event of electrocution, where can you find your complaint, how many electrocutions there have been in the city possibly that is available in public domain, how many deaths have occurred in terms of people falling into small puddles because it has rained, all of that is available to you. And therefore, consequently, the minute that you are aware of your rights, the minute you know which door to knock, you automatically build the confidence levels and build the courage to knock at that door because you know that you are knocking at the right door. You know what lies behind that door. It is no more as open. The door may be your wood, but believe me, the internet has made sure that even the wood is transparent and you know behind the door who, who stays behind the door, what authority does he or she have and what happens if I knock at that door. If we juxtapose that to an information driven society that we have today, I really would possibly, you know, go contrary to what the law is and go contrary to what the political leaders so believe and say that you don't need really a right to legal services act anymore. I think the domain of knowledge that is available to an average citizen is far greater than what it was 15 years ago. Now if that is what it is, then the question is what else can we do to make sure that your knowledge translates to the right things that you will do to get access to justice. And that knowledge translating to the right actions for access to justice, in my view, comes only, and in our country can come only, with community participation. It gone are those days where one individual could stand up and fight, and everybody would walk behind that individual and say that you are the leader, you are the martyr. If Mahatma Gandhi possibly existed today, and possibly wanted to fight for a particular concept, I doubt the number of people that would have followed him. Possibly there would be more criticisms on Gandhi and more people who would critique him rather than follow him. How is it then that we have an Anna Hazare movement which has actually championed crusade against corruption? How is that for with all its idiosyncrasies and deficiencies, the Aadmi Party continues to do what it does? That is simply because the power of collective movement. And what is that we really fail to understand when we talk of the power of collective movement? What we fail to understand is that democracy is really made up of each one of us. We are both the construct of democracy in terms of being the individual cells in democracy. Without me, there is no democracy. And so without you, there is no democracy. But not only are we the construct, and that's what is taught to us in school, saying that we constitute democracy, it is for the people, etc. But what they don't teach us in school is that construct of democracy is useless unless it interoperates with each other. Stand alone, as an individual, all of us are useless. But collectively, just look at the power of saying one of us will stand out in the road and scream about the rains that are going on and possibly floods outside and people really struggling to cross the road. Nobody will listen to you. If every single person in the room were to walk out in here, just outside the school, and stand as a group and scream, believe me, the local MLA will be there in 15 minutes to turn up and say, no, can I be of you? And therefore, that individual aspect of saying that I am no doubt individual in the construct of democracy. But my power emanates from my interoperation with each of you is really the power of democracy that we need to learn and that's something which is not taught to us. And rightly so, I think as I said, they teach everything to you except climbing the tree when it comes to a cat. And that is not taught to you because possibly the powers that be at that point in time, when they planned out what sort of human resource development we should have in our country, what sort of education policy we should have in our country, really considered and deeply thought of one aspect of not what to teach, but of what not to teach. Because they knew that a completely aware citizenry is really not good news for political democracy for the parties that are in power. Democracy is great when the average intelligentsia is low. Democracy is great when the average capacity of the individual who is exercising his franchise is low. And that is when democracy can thrive more as an oligarchy in terms of a group of people governing this country, transcending political parties. I may have my lineages towards the right wing, you may have your lineages towards the left wing. Some may be center, some may be left of center, some may be right of center. But let us, let us clearly understand one thing, that irrespective of which political ideology we may have, all of them have governed this country as an oligarchy. 
It is a group of people in each of those political parties. Of course, in some party it will be one person and, and dynasty. That's a different matter. But even in the in the in the comparatively better political systems that we have in the country, even there it is a group of people. And power, therefore, does not transcend from a group of people to an average community level participation. Let me again on a free meeting discussion take a scenario. Just look at Bangalore, for example. We have a crore of people, unofficially about a crore and 20 lakh people. Officially today close to a crore of people. By statistics and uh, uh, census today about 85 lakh, 90 lakh people. Therefore close to a crore of people in Bangalore, what sort of governance do we have? Let me juxtapose it to Iceland which is 3.5 lakh people in the entire country. 3.5 lakh people in the entire country of Iceland have three levels of governance. They have a federal structure in terms of a president that they elect and, and Charles, uh, is called Charlie by name, they are not called Ajax Mahodai or His Excellency the President of Ireland, they call him by first name and rightly so. That is when you will connect to your leader and that is when you will believe in your leader when you can relate to your leader from hours one to one. If I have to call my President Ajax Mahodai and say Your Excellency my Lord, it is as much as I connect to the gods. There is only so much I connect. The only time we connect to our gods is when we die and they say that okay that is when we go and become one with God. When we are alive, we don't connect to our gods, we connect to our temples, we connect to our churches, we connect to our mosques, we connect to our religious groups, but we don't connect to God. Now I am not being spiritual about it, but I am just coming back to the political spectrum. Similarly, when we start calling our leaders, your royal highness, excellency, etc., we don't connect to them and therefore there is only that level of governance that translates from them to us. Coming to Iceland, there is a president at, at the federal level. There are provincial governments with provincial leaders at every province and there is local self-government coming to every village and every town in Iceland. So three and a half lakh people have three levels of governance. And look at Bangalore, we have one crore people and what is the level of governance that we have? For thank God we at least had one Brahat Bindur Mahanagara Palike with 200 wards. Even that has been dissolved and I don't think we are going to have elections in the next 6 years, 6 months. Simply because the I got of Karnataka also has told them that yes you have 6 months. So just look at our lives in the next 6 months. For a minute get a sit down today and ban our lives in the next 6 months and see where we stand. And are we actually going to be good human beings? Are we actually going to get what we deserve? And are we actually going to give what the community deserves of us? In the next six months, you will have no local representative heeding to or also saying, I have had water, no water, my footpath is bad, my roads are flooded, my drainage is clogged. There is nobody who will talk to you. They talk to you possibly five months and twenty days thereafter because that's when elections will come. Number one. Number two, for a crore of people, you have 28 MLS. Just do the math. Even if these 28 MLS are superhumans, can they deal with the problems of a crore of people? What are we even trying to say? It is like pouring rose water to the sea and saying now the sea is cleansed. So if I have to cleanse the entire river, I bring the little bit of Ganga Jal and throw it into the river here, which is Arkavati, the most polluted river we can find. Or Kumudavati, which now does not exist. When they said that they are now spending a lot of money to find Saraswati, because the mythical river, I, I, I tweeted saying they should spend a little bit of that money to find our Kumudavati here because Kumudavati existed a few years ago and does not exist today. It is today a dry bed with people having built houses on, on the on the river beds. But if that is a scenario with 28 people, can they govern us at all? What sort of mockery are we doing to turn up and say we have a constitution, we have a constitutional democracy, we elect our leaders and our leaders will actually therefore be there for us, they have years. 28 people put together twice the number of years, each person has two years. Please tell me, can they deal with the crore of people? Now that's the structure of governance that we have. Then we have a federal governance which possibly for the entire city of Bangalore, including the larger greater Bangalore, you have five MPs. I am including all the, you know, Bangalore metropolitan extended region as well. Five people for the crore of people. Now therefore, if that is the level of governance that we have, Please juxtapose that, and these are things we never juxtapose. Please juxtapose that to access to justice. Why are we turning up and saying that our courts are the only mechanism by which we have access to justice? Access to justice begins at every level of governance, not just judicial spectrum. Access to justice does not mean knocking at the doors of the court, filing a civil suit, or filing a red petition for certain relief. That is the last mile. 
access to justice means that you will have a level of governance and transparency in governance where you can not get your immediate representative to say listen I believe that there is adharma being conducted here you don't need to know the law you need to know only humanism and based on a pedestal of humanism I believe what is happening here is not right and therefore deal with it that is access to justice Therefore, access to justice transcends into every aspect of governance that we have. It transcends into every aspect of life that we live. The fact that I don't drive on the left side of the road and I'm driving on the right side of the road means I am causing injustice to somebody else who's driving on the correct side of the road. The fact that I play music loud in the middle of the night and party because I'm having fun means that I'm actually impeding upon somebody else's right to sleep. And therefore, that access to justice really did not happen with you going and filing a petition in court and getting some order from court so that you can implement it. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that is what justice is looked at to be in our country. It means if a lady IAS's officer's reputation is being maligned and thrown onto the streets, unfortunately, she has to knock the doors of a court on a Sunday and say that please give me an order so that they don't have to put discouraging statements about me in public domain. Let me give again a few examples and say hey, what, a, what a rotten system that we live in irrespective of political parties. A man died. For what reason we don't know. Fine, the man is dead. Do we respect the uh, soul that is departed and let that be? No, we don't. We create a big scene about why he is dead, how he is dead, what is the reason. But like all, we don't want to respect the dead. So be it. But we don't even respect the ones who are alive. And the very next morning, there is a proposition to say, no, 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 in the floor of the house of the legislature, which is the apex body for governance in the state, I want to make a statement to say, this my gentleman possibly had an affair with that particular lady, therefore he killed himself. Not really looking into the aspect of saying, what is going through the life of that particular lady, on whom you want to make a statement, with no rational information on whether that statement is true or not. You have been told and you believe it to be true. When does truth come out? As the realist system of jurisprudence says, what is truth? Truth is the last judgment of the last judge. Truth is not the first judgment of the first judge. You will file an appeal and go to the high court, file an appeal, go to the Supreme Court. Finally, what the Supreme Court says, by a realist jurisprudence, that is true because that is final. As Justice Krishna I have said, the Supreme Court is not right because it is infallible. The Supreme Court is just right because it is final. Because there is no more, no more appeal that I can take to. Now from that perspective, if you look at it, please see what, what our government did, irrespective of political ideologies. They were more than happy to save their skin in terms of political power, to save their skin in terms of cleansing the governance, to make a statement on the floor of the house, attributing certain relationships between a man who is dead, for whom you have no respect and regard, to a woman who is alive, at least for her you should have respect and regard. Therefore, if you live in a society where we don't know how to respect our women, if you live in a society where we don't know how much we should say and what not to say vis-a-vis -vis a particular lady, what are we giving unto ourselves in terms of justice? And mind you, that lady is not from the bottom of the pyramid. That lady is from the top of the pyramid. She is a serving IAS officer of the state. I am only raising that as a ground because if she has to go and knock the doors of a judge on a Sunday to say, I need an order from your hand, otherwise I will be maligned. What are we talking in terms of governance? What are we talking in terms of justice? And what are we talking in terms of access to that justice? I asked myself again two questions. There was so much of coverage in the media in terms of what happened about the gentleman who died and every other company being involved, every other uh, person writing about a potential relationship between X and Y, etc. How many of us really had the guts to write at least a column or write at least a reaction to that media to say what you're doing is not right? All of us read the newspapers and I am including myself in that group. All of us had our morning cup of coffee or tea. All of us read the newspaper. Some of us who at least had a conscience said, child, this is not right. And then left it. That is injustice. The injustice is when we realize that there is a wrong and we don't stand up to it in our own little way. That is injustice. The injustice is that when we realize that there is something wrong and we still don't interoperate with each other to turn up and say can we do something as a community, that is injustice. Gone are the days when we had to walk miles to interact with the community. Gone are the days when we had to come up to the village square and get together on a Sunday to interact and create a, a platform of community to raise a voice. Today is the day where your telephone, your mobile phone, your tweets, your messages on Facebook, your interactions on social media,